So thank you. Good evening. I'm David Levine, I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. With me tonight is um, my co-chair, um, Joseph Bonner, and he's operating the camera and also um, <clears throat> we'll put this on YouTube for people who can't make it tonight. Um, my guest is a prize, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Amy Doxer Marcus. Um, she's best known for award-winning reporting for the Wall Street Journal, where she highlights how science is transforming society and raising bioethical questions. She earned the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for best reporting for her masterful stories about patients, families, and physicians that illuminated the often unseen world of cancer survivors. Her piece, Trials, Saving Kids, Changing Science for the Wall Street Science for the Wall Street Journal is named one of the best of narrative storytelling by the Neiman Reports. And she also won a 2014 <clears throat> AAAS Calvi Science Journalism Award. So the book we're talking about tonight is called We the Scientists, How a Daring Team of Parents and Doctors Forged a New Path for Medicine. Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you, let you tell me a little bit about the book. Um, well, thanks for having me here tonight. I really appreciate it. And I, um, I'm excited to talk to science writers. I think that's great. Um, so the, the sort of origin story of the book is that um, I met a group of parents whose children have a rare and fatal condition. It's a cholesterol metabolism disorder called Neiman Pick type C um, or NPC. And these parents wanted to accelerate the search for a drug that might be effective in treating the condition. There is no drug that, um, that, that cures NPC disease. And they thought that the way to do it would be to try to, to um, create an innovative partnership with a group of scientists and researchers who are interested in working together to find a drug. And I followed along for over a decade sort of through the ups and the downs and the challenges of trying to create a partnership where scientific knowledge could be co-developed and that they would work together. Okay. Um, so this story is, is told in the beginning through one family. Um, I don't know if you could talk about that family and it's, uh, the twins. Yeah, no, the story, um, the book opens with the story of um, a, a couple named Chris and Hugh Hempel who have twin daughters, Addie and Cassidy, um, who are both diagnosed with NPC disease. And they're looking for um, a way to help their daughters. And, you know, they're entrepreneurs. They're based out in Silicon Valley. They're used to sort of working quickly and using the internet. They were, you know, early pioneers in the internet era. And they quickly identify a group of you know, parents with a similar idea and scientists who are already sort of in that space and working towards that. And they all decide to join forces and create a kind of collaborative where they start using NIH screening equipment to look for drugs and they prioritize different compounds and they try and they, they find one that Chris and Hugh especially think is the most promising and they decide to try to seek permission from the FDA to give the compound to their daughters. Um, so um, this is through compassionate use? Yes, this okay. is with the hope that they'll be able to collect the data in a way that either will um, help the scientists as they try to organize a more formal clinical trial with a placebo control arm, um, or that would supplement data for a clinical trial that the FDA could then consider um, so that they would have additional data from children who don't qualify for a clinical trial. Yes, so, you know, in reading the book, you know, a lot of it is, that, you know, how, you know, you know, patients or in this case, you know, teams of parents um, can work with scientists. And from the scientific point of view, there are there are several scientists who are afraid to even start a trial like this because saying, well, what if someone dies? Mm -hmm. And um, and then the, the parent has to decide, you know, it's kind of pushing back saying, well, they're going to die anyways. 
Um, but I imagine there are some parents who don't want who don't want to take the risk. And and then they also you you know talk about you know one of the trials where the FDA panel was measuring, saying that the they didn't like the study, they didn't like the results, they didn't like uh, anything. They said that um, they didn't they didn't see see that the children were improving at all. But then they went on to approve the drug basically because there was nothing else. And I think this story is, is being played on the Alzheimer's community, where there are drugs that are of questionable value, but because there is nothing else, they're, they're, you know, the advocacy groups are very strong, and the people are saying, you know, what do I have to lose? So what do people what do the people have to lose when they say, okay, I just want to, I just want a drug, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So, well, first of all, I just wanted to say one thing, which is in the trial that you reference right. the, and the FDA advisory committee recommended that the FDA approve the drug, but the FDA decided not to approve the drug. Right. So it's still used by the children. It's still prescribed by the doctors because the doctors believe it is benefiting the children. So they're able to prescribe it because the drug is already approved for a different indication. And so the, the doctors write off-label prescriptions. So of course the concern, um, as you mentioned and alluded to is if a drug isn't effective, um, you know, it's then you're taking on a lot of risk and you're not getting any benefit. I think one of the controversies that arose for this NPC trial is that um, it's hard, it's hard with a rare disease to gather sufficient data that is persuasive to the FDA in shorter periods of time. Because in the, in the case of cyclodextrin, which is the drug that these parents identified jointly with the um, scientists, um, the trial was originally um, created so that it would last a year. And, but it turns out that now the scientists believe a year isn't long enough in order to really know if the drug is working. So I think some of the challenges with what you're talking about is that you need to design the trial in a way that you're actually gonna get a clear answer. And a lot of times there's not a clear answer. And that's where you have these controversies and advisory committee meetings and disputes with the FDA. So how'd you get, how'd you get involved with these families in the first place? So, I had my own personal experience with sort of um, like a rare frustration with rare diseases, which was that my mother was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer um, called gall gallbladder cancer. It's not common and it was metastatic and she passed away after only, you know, two, two and a half years. And I tried to help her by sort of being a reporter you know, I would, I, I read all the scientific papers and I interviewed all the scientists and I reached out to doctors and I was trying to figure out why there really were no therapies. And the therapy that her doctor was recommended she take was like 40 plus years old and had really terrible results. I mean, it, to me, when I read the papers, it looked like it wasn't going to help at all. So, you know, I started to think more about the kind of systemic issues that might exist with why is it so hard to develop drugs? How come rare diseases have such a hard time getting persuasive evidence? And I started traveling around and meeting people who were experiencing something similar and trying to think of novel ways to address the problem. And at one point, a, a government official who had sort of given me advice about how to research my mother's disease called me and said, you know, I know you're interested in innovative models and different ways of looking for rare disease drugs. Um, there's a group of parents that I met who are trying to partner with scientists and they're thinking really outside the box and they wanna do some novel things. And I think it would be an interesting model for you to follow. And so I got introduced to the parents and went to their first meetings and then kind of kept going. I mean, it, it, the questions that they all discussed with each other they weren't only questions about science, although of course that was one of the things they were doing was trying to assess the science. But a lot of the questions they asked were also about like, how can we work together? And 
you know, what kind of expertise do patients bring and what kind of expertise do scientists bring and how do we weight those things and how do we integrate those things so that we can advance drug development more effectively? Okay, you talk about um, a short story called The Cathedral. Yeah. Why don't you tell that? I thought that, I thought that was a very interesting story. Why don't you tell, tell that and how it's germane to this discussion? Yeah, so I... I um. I share in the book that, you know, I really tried to understand sort of the, the history of patient advocacy, there are ethical questions that can surround the, the field that sometimes is called citizen science, sometimes it's called patient-led research. I mean, there's all kinds of names for this. And I did go back to school during the process of working on this book to study bioethics. I really wanted to understand what the um, traditional frameworks were for protecting patients' rights, what the research models were and how to move forward from there. And I took a narrative bioethics class and one of the short stories that the professor assigned us to read was a short story by Raymond Carver called Cathedral. And one of the things I say in the book is that when I first read the story, I mean, it's a really moving story, but on the face of it, I didn't quite understand why we were being assigned to read it because it's a story about a married couple and their relationship is fraying and troubled. And, you know, one of the woman's friend is, is, a, is a blind man who comes to stay with them. And the husband feels sort of suspicious about his presence there. And um, she leaves them alone in the room and so they start watching television together and they start talking and, they, and the husband starts asking about, do you know what a cathedral looks like? Um, and they eventually draw a cathedral together. They try to like collaborate to create a cathedral. And I found that imagery, both also of like people who are in a small space and have a relationship and are trying to work together and know one another, not being always able to see each other clearly. And also the image of a cathedral, which to me represents sort of the power that traditional science, like the cathedral of science, I started to sort of see resonance, I guess, with everything that I was experiencing when I saw the patients and the, and the parents and the scientists and the doctors trying to build a cathedral together, essentially, a new way of doing science. So the traditional cathedral of science has been under attack um, which, you know, historically, scientists always had the highest reputation of, mo of any profession. And they're, you know, I mean, during the space era, they were admired, you know, as, as you know, great people. Um, and, you know, everyone just thought, okay, if, if they say it, it's got to be true. And now we know that, you know, and I think COVID taught us that um, if you look at what happened to Dr. Fauci and many other scientists who have been on the show who have had death threats, um, you know, that scientists are not held in as great esteem. And um, and also, and I think there's also at the same time, there's been a movement for scientists to learn to communicate better with people. Alan Alda has a school in Stony Brook. Um, I mean, years ago, you know, people talked about Carl Sagan, it was, you know, someone who was, just a great communicator who's on talk shows all the time and uh and you know there and we re there really hasn't been someone as respected as him you know by the general public you know as a you know you know as someone i mean i, I know they showed a clip of mr rogers going to congress and talking about the importance of edu education not cutting these, these funds mm -hmm. and so people people can make a difference um well, what do you think scientists need to know about working with parents, and what are some of the what what are some of the and why why is it, is it why have they traditionally been reluctant to to work with families, and what is the strength of families can bring, mm -hmm. and also what is this, what is some what is some of the dangers that families can bring? Yeah, it's a lot of questions. But. Yeah, that's a lot of questions, but I'm um, I'm just jotting them down so I can remember. Um, I think the strength that families bring, and I think the scientists in this collaboration recognize this strength, is that they're passionate, 
they are they have a sense of urgency they want to help their children and they can they keep people on track um they are able to uh, you know sometimes raise resources they can go to regulatory agencies and plead their case um, they have a way of connecting different scientists together and encouraging them to work together. I think the concern that the scientists expressed was that maybe they would not be as rigorous as the scientists about the data or that they might have emotional feelings, you know, and let that sway them over mm -hmm. data. But, you know, some of the scientists, when they were being sort of candid and open, I think spoke about how they too bring, have their own biases and get their own passions and sometimes you know are swayed by data that turns out to not be accurate and what I think I think what they learned together was that you know you mentioned in earlier in your question you said communication science communication and that there's not good communicators I think one of the things I learned from this journey was that it's not really about science communication. I think it should be more about conversation. And by that, I mean, when I think sometimes when we think about science communication, we think of the scientists coming to explain to the people what they think, what they should think and how they should assess this information and how they should feel. And the fact is, is that a lot of things about science involve value judgments and people can look at the same set of data, including two scientists, and can sometimes have different conclusions or different assessments of the risks versus the benefits based on the same set of data. And so I think what the families were trying to argue and what I think many of the scientists ended up thinking too, is that the most effective kind of work in science involves all the parties exchanging ideas, recognizing the expertise that they all bring to the project and trying to come to some sort of like joint sort of conclusion rather than one group of people telling another group of people what the right answer is. Okay, um, for those listening in, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and I will get to them. Um, so I want to ask you about the, because um, you do talk about it, the parallels with COVID. Is that you know a new disease? Scientists, you know, were learning uh, things, and then you had the phenomenon of um, the parents of um, patients who became long, you know, had long COVID, long haulers, who became a, a very large advocacy group and a pretty successful one. Uh, you know, uh, you know. I think, um, you know, judging by the amount of press they get and the amount of, um, you know, I think even the uh, Francis Collins, you know, talked about them, mm -hmm. and um, he was the, the former head of the NIH, and you know, it was kind of acknowledged that there was a problem, and and the scientists at the time, uh, you know. They still, there's still no real answer to it. There's still a lot, you know, to be to, to learn about it. Um, so the other, the other thing I, I was thinking about is that the the Hempel family had a lot of resources. Like you said, they he worked for Netscape. He was like a Net worked for Netscape, one of the founders. Both did. Mm -hmm. Both did. Mm -hmm. and so they had a lot of money. Does yeah. yeah. having a lot of money help you in your advocacy for, uh, I mean, help, it helps you to see your, your senator or you know, you're more connected? Well, I think that resources are, do help advocacy groups get going, usually. Um, but I also think that resources can be broader than money. Of course, money is important in if you if you're starting a group and you want to like fund research and you want to give out grants so people raise money. Um, some of the families in this NPC collaborative, you know, they raised money by running you know concerts and bake sales and golf tournaments. It wasn't all, that they had all the resources themselves and that they paid out of pocket. But resources also 
include social networks and also education and a sense of confidence that you can challenge authority figures. I think that sometimes people forget that many of us grow up, you know, with with the idea that, um, you know, it's hard to challenge people in authority and doctors who are treating your children that have a fatal disease are certainly people in you know positions of authority and scientists that you want to persuade to try to research the disease that your child has are in a position of authority and so i think that not just the hempel family but all the families that i talk about in the book and that work together in this collaborative they did have a unique set of resources that enabled them to form this partnership it did include sometimes money, of course, but it included more than that. It included their um, their ability to dig into the scientific literature and to understand it and to ask questions, their confidence to call up an email scientist to ask questions and to try to network and to connect them, their feeling of confidence to go into the NIH and to identify the people who they could persuade mm-hmm. to, you know, create conferences and invite them into labs. So, you know, of course, um, I think that it's important that these sorts of um, resources be widely available to to all people. Um, But I don't think it's a surprise that often when you look at um, patient advocacy groups who are getting started, that it does tend to be people who have a certain level of of social or economic power. Yeah, and I was also looking at their Facebook page, uh, and they, and, you know, and they have, have a lot of followers. So, you know, they, they, I think they, <clears throat> they're a good example of, and also, I believe that the mother co-authored a paper with the scientist. Yes, no, she did. She came up with a mm-hmm. hypothesis um, after she read a scientist's paper. And she proposed a study idea to him, and he thought it was a really good question. And he devised an experiment, and he engaged her as part of his team. Um, You know, that was one of the things that the various parents were saying that I don't think that they were saying necessarily that, um, that we have the same type of expertise. Um, or even that we, we have the equivalent of PhDs. They weren't saying that either. What they were saying is, we've immersed ourselves and made ourselves expert in a disease that many clinicians never see during the course of a career. And we are, we're, um, we think about it, we read every paper that comes out, we talk to every scientist we can. And so we have good ideas and we can ask good questions. And I think that that was really their message. And with the, with the long COVID patients that you mentioned, I think that one of the reasons why they were able to sort of um, get up and running is many of the patients themselves um, had scientific backgrounds. Some of them were practicing scientists who knew their way around a lab and knew how to write, write papers because that's what they did professionally. They also came at it at a time when there weren't recognized experts yet. You know, it was a novel disease that everybody was getting up to speed with. And so they were able to get a lot of traction. And, um, you know, but when they write their own sort of histories of their, how their movement started, they credit the patient advocacy groups that came before them. They, you know, they talk about HIV activism. They talk about other, other types of patient advocacy groups that they drew encouragement from when they were trying to advance their own um, research agenda. Well, I remember the AIDS activists were, very vocal, and also they actually took over people's offices. Yeah, you know, small companies' offices. Um, they, they, Nobody in that my group that I wrote about did that. Nobody was chaining themselves to the FDA or, no. you know, some of the things that get described in some of the HIV histories. Um, even uh, in the nineteen nineties, I was at the American Psychiatric Association meeting, and there were people who were opposed to some of the changes that they were proposing, and were like demonstrating in the streets of Philadelphia. Yeah. So that was, you know, it's, it's quite powerful to see these things. Um, so let's, I want to talk about, you know, how in general um, rare diseases or orphan diseases are treated. And 
I mean, unlike illnesses like depression and cancer, where you it's, it affects people, billions of people worldwide. Th these, you know, affect a few people. A lot of doctors, as you say, have never even seen a case like this. And, and drug companies don't have a lot of incentive to really come up with new drugs to treat you know, 20 patients a year that might get this disease. Yeah. So tell, tell us about the, the whole process. What, 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 is the, what is the government doing, doing to try and get you know, new, new treatments and new research for these drugs, for these illnesses? Yeah, yeah I mean, this, this is the problem. I mean, collectively, rare diseases represent a tremendous amount of people. I mean, you know, there's millions and millions and millions of people collectively have rare diseases. But the problem is, is that you know, when you break them down into individual diseases, mm -hmm. it's really hard. I mean, with the Neiman pick type C disease, when I started reporting, um, they were quoting numbers of only like 200 cases in the United States and maybe 500 in the world. That's really hard to get drug companies, you know, to get involved when it's that when it's that number of people. So the government has a variety of programs where they try to offer incentives to researchers to work with them if they and to try to advance the research so that's certainly you know one method but also in the rare disease community it's a very vibrant community and many of these groups um form and you know online and they they network with each other they raise money they share strategies they have meetings they connect with scientists i mean you know a lot of it is self organized but there are so many groups now and with the you know the rise of the internet people are able to communicate and find each other and um find resources that they need that weren't available years ago. And so, um, I, and I think that drug companies have become increasingly interested in rare diseases because, you know, the flip side is if they do find an effective therapy, they're able to um, receive incentives from the government, um, you know, marketing incentives and other financial incentives to develop and improve a drug. And um, also um, they're able to charge high prices when the drug does succeed. And also the drug may have other uses too. Yeah, I mean, that's the drug that we started talking about in the beginning that um, the doctors to this day continue to prescribe off label for these patients because it's not approved for NPC disease, but it is for another disease. I mean, that's what happened. Like it got developed for a different disease, but it's used for, for, for NPC disease. Um. Unfortunately, um, you, know, you know, when you read this about the families, the, the, the children don't live very long with this mm -hmm. disease. Um, so, what, so um, but I guess, you know, I'm kind of heartened by the fact that, you know, the, the families, you know, despite losing children, you know, still keep on, you know, getting involved with, with this. Um, yeah. They're, they're, they are amazing families. Um, I mean, it's, it's true in the book that several of the children, you know, of the families that I followed for so many years did pass away during the time I was writing the book. Some of the children are still alive as well. And certainly their parents and their doctors believe that their lives were extended due to the um, drugs that they were taking. Uh, but it's of course not enough, and it's really a rallying cry to 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 continue and to find ways to advance drugs and the partnerships and collaboration, the model that they that they tried to develop. I think that they've continued to develop the model as well as the drugs because they believe that that's the way to um, move this forward and try to and try to get a drug approved. So, what are some of the rare diseases that? Um... You know, you see positive developments in. Well, I mean, I think I'm trying to think of like off the top of my head because in the book, I really focus very much on this particular disease, NPC disease, rather than the rare disease, you know, spectrum. Um, but hmm, that's a really good question. 
Let me think about that. I can't think of anything off the top of my head where I'm where I'm using that as a model. I guess you could say ALS. I mean, they had a drug, you know, approved recently, and that's a relatively rare disease as well. Mm -hmm. no. There's been a lot of, you know, advocacy and effective advocacy in the ALS space. So that's a good example. Another example of an advocacy group that works very closely with um, the drug development community and the science science community. Um, I've been to meetings at the um, Michael J. Fox Foundation because you know, I live near Water Cornell and they have some meetings there. And he seems to have been able to, you know, I mean, unfortunately Parkinson's is, is I mean, it's not a rare disease, but um, he's been able to get people to to give spinal taps for research. So he's able to, you know, I mean, so I, mean, I think having sometimes, I mean, he's, he, you know, someone like Michael J. Fox is a better advocate for, you know, research than a scientist because he's a celebrity, you know, he's, you know, has celebrity status, you know. Yeah, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think he's, I think he's an effective advocate because also he's a patient. I mean, right. I don't, there's just no substitute. I mean, you can, you can see that you can see the impact that having that disease has had on him. And it's hard not to feel moved by um, seeing what a disease does to somebody. I think sometimes we forget about what the consequences are, you know, if we don't move more quickly. And that's not to say not to do good science. I think the book the argument in the book is not to somehow do shoddy science. No, the argument in the book is that science can be better if it draws on the data and the expertise of all the groups involved, not just one way, not just one type of data or one group providing the data. Are there some scientists who will never be persuaded that working with uh, advocacy groups is a good idea? I mean, there's always going to be people who don't who don't think it's a good idea. I mean, okay. I you know, I'm not trying to say that there's one model that everyone should follow. I think families and patients and scientists and doctors, you know, they can do whatever variation they want. They can come up with their own model. They're, a collaborative model is just is exactly that. It is a collaboration and collaborations look different depending on who the members of the collaboration are. There's not really one size fits all. So where does the MPC movement stand now? I mean, like you said, the drug was, you know, the drug was um, rejected. So, um, okay, so the drug that the parents and the scientists and the collaboration that I describe in the book, um, the trial that the drug company ran um, did not succeed. It failed. Um, the company actually ended up selling the rights to the drug to another company. And the parents and the scientists have continued working together to gather data. And this new company is advancing that drug and in conversations with the FDA about how to move it forward. So they're still hopeful that they will eventually get this drug approved. In addition, there are other trials underway with other companies because often what happens is when there's a drug trial or when there's a sign of interest that's that something is moving forward, other companies, if they see the potential for a regulatory path forward, they also become interested. So all of this work and this ferment ended up encouraging other companies to also take a look and to try to develop drugs. And maybe one of those will work and be um, approved also, who knows. Um, in this disease, is there a way to tell it in advance whether somebody will have it? So in order to get this disease, you have to inherit one faulty gene from each parent. Mm -hmm. And so you, technically speaking, you could do carrier testing before you get pregnant to see if you and your partner are carriers. If you are, then you could try to um, have a baby in a different way so that the disease wouldn't be passed on. Um, but this is not a common disease and it's not one that typically is tested for in carrier testing, but 
but if you had a family member that had it, I guess, you know, you'd be alert to it and you could request carrier testing. So there is testing available if you want to know if you're a carrier. So um, with your mother's illness, this was a time when um, there wasn't a lot of patient advocacy. In there. Um, I mean, hers is a very rare, 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 you know, rare, rare form of cancer. And um, did you feel any resentment that you were doing all this research and no one was really, other people weren't doing this research? No, I didn't feel resentment. I felt, I felt sad, actually. Yeah. Okay. I felt, I felt this deep, deep sadness. And I guess I sometimes was mad at myself because, you know, at the time of my mother's diagnosis, there, there was a lot of patient advocacy in the cancer space, just not for my mother's specific form of cancer. And mm -hmm. the reason why there was a lot of advocacy was because cancer patients and their families had started advocacy groups. And, you know, I, it felt so overwhelming to me to do such a thing, to, to start a, an advocacy group. And my mother happened to not want to do that type of thing. She was a very private person and she wanted to spend her time with her family and she didn't want to you know start start a group or do something but i think my frustration with my experience was that i did encounter scientists who had an interest in gallbladder cancer and even had tumor samples and other specimens but they didn't have a lot of research funding and so that was another thing i was thinking about like what are the systemic issues that make it so hard for families to advance these types of um, projects? You know, and I'm hopeful that some of the systemic changes um, that they're that people are working on making them, and that patients in the future will benefit from them, and families like mine. Okay, so I have some, some several questions. I'm going to read this to you. Oh, have you and the parents and scientists worked with any of the rare disease organizations like? NORD, National Organization of Rare Diseases. Mm -hmm. Yes, what was the outcome? The parents in this specific, that I chronicled, that I was writing about, that did they work with NORD? Yes, I guess. So, I mean, NORD's a great group and they have a lot of, you know, they do a lot of great work and a lot of information, but the families that, um, that I was writing about, they each had their own um, family foundation. Also, there are um, two, two, two or three now major patient advocacy organizations that work on Neiman Peck type C disease. So for, from their perspective, it made more sense to work with advocacy organizations that were directly focusing on the disease that their children had rather than an umbrella organization that was working on rare disease, you know, in general, although both are important things to do. Okay, so second question is this. It sounds as though the patients you wrote about look to drug companies to make medications, but how can the drug companies find patients when they run a clinical trial? It's hard to find patients with rare diseases in clinical trials. Yeah, so in this particular instance, um, the, the National um, Neiman Pick Disease Foundation Group, which has been around for many years and was founded by families years ago, they have an annual kind of family support conference and science conference, and the drug companies all come to this conference. They come and they give presentations about the science, they come and meet families, um, and so they're able to um, you know, get to know the families and to recruit from these families as well. In addition, the families um, that are members of these groups have, have a patient registry where they um, gather data about the people, about the families, about the patients, medical records, and they, they do it in a, in a systematic way so that when drug companies are looking to do trials, um, they're able to use this data. And they also have scientific advisory boards um, that that work with the, their patient or um, advisory, uh, their patient advocacy organizations, and those scientists often are tapped by the drug companies to work on the trials, run the trials, and also reach out to patients. 
Uh, I have one another question. Are there, are there countries other than the United States that provide a better environment for the development of treatments for rare diseases? I don't feel like I, I know enough about the drug development system in other countries to say that they're better. But what I can say is that in many instances, in terms of developing drugs for NPC disease, the drug companies sought to develop them in Europe and other countries, as well as the United States. And the regulatory um, agencies, the FDA and the EMA in Europe, were in close contact with each other. So, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of drug development systems in each of these countries, but from a regulatory perspective, there is a lot of collaboration between the regulatory authorities. Uh, I have one more question. Um, how can the, what, are, what is the ME community? What does that stand for? That is um, a, a name for chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, it's myalgic encephalitis, I want to say. I, I hope I didn't okay. mangle that word. ME so how, CMS. So how can the ME um, community make, make sure to be included in long COVID research? NIH will not require an ME cohort in inappropriate long COVID research funded by the NIH. So um, the ME community and the long COVID community in terms of the patient advocacy communities have started to and continue to do a lot of work together. Um, the patient-led research collaborative, which was set up by a group of people who have long COVID symptoms and suffer from long COVID, they organized a patient panel recently to help give out research grants and to choose projects. And they chose 15 patient researchers to be on their panel to give this money out. And they included patients with ME-CFS. So there are a lot of um, common issues. There's immune dysregulation, there's cognitive dysfunction. And I think within the patient communities, there is um, more work being done together. And so perhaps that advocacy that they're already doing together will extend to advocating that the NIH, you know, take that in when they're forming their own studies. So I want to talk a little bit about the craft of writing because um, you're basically, you're a reporter. Um, <laughs> and how long did it take you to write this book and what were some of the challenges? So it took me a really, a really long time to write the book. I mean, you know, I met them in 2007 and it's mm. 2023 now. Um, but part of the challenge was that I initially wanted to wait until there was sort of an outcome with this drug that they had been pursuing. And it took, it took a really long time to just get the results of the trial. And, and even though the, the, the trial failed, they're still efforts, you know, to potentially start another trial or, you know, or reanalyze the data and work with the FDA to try to still get it approved. So that was one challenge was just that I was interested in finding out the ending of this particular journey and it took a while. But the other thing that took a while was the fact that as you alluded to, I mean, I am a working reporter. Um, I have a day job and it's, takes a lot out of me. And I did a lot of the writing on weekends. I woke up super early in the morning, tried to write, you know, I did, I got up at like, you know, five in the morning a lot. So I could do writing on the book before I did, did my reporting for the newspaper. And um, yeah, I took all, I, I took all of my vacation time year after year to, to write, but it's hard to write a book and it took a long time. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I haven't, I've, I've written a lot of book chapters and I've edited books, but I'm saying, oh, I, don't, I really want to take all this time because I, like you, I do other things. It well. was a passion project though. I, it really was. I mean, yes. it started with the passion that like, I had my own personal experience with my mom. And then I met these like incredible families and got to know them so well and got to know the scientists who are also great people. I mean, just the most committed scientists and doctors and, and the government officials. I mean, you know, they were really, they really tried so hard and, you know, to find new ways to work and to collaborate. And, um, you know, it, it, it took a long time, but like I said, it, I was very committed to, to the project. So your book is being published um... 
uh, next Tuesday, Valentine's Day. Yeah. Um, and um, okay. So where can people get this book? Well, you can order it um, online. Um, you know, like every, any bookstore is, you know, online bookstore is going to sell it and it'll be in, it'll be in physical bookstores too, starting on Tuesday. You can hopefully go into your local bookstore and get it, but yeah, you know, you can order it from anyone. Um, you know, there's tons of indie bookstores and bookshop and, you know, any place you usually order your books. Are you going to go on a tour? I have some um, bookstore I'm speaking at a bookstore in the Boston area. I'm speaking at a bookstore in Washington, D.C. And I am interested in, in talking to some um, podcasts and Zoom calls. And if there are groups that watch this and see this and have novel ideas about, you know, places to talk about the book, happy to do that as well. Okay. Um, and what are you working on for the Wall Street Journal? So I am a health and science reporter, and I usually cover topics that have this sort of intersection with bioethics. So I've been writing a lot about xenotransplantation with the pig organs, gene editing pig organs. I write a lot about um, donor conception and um, some of the efforts to change fertility laws in this country. I've done a lot of stories on that recently as well. And I still cover rare diseases. Um, so let's go back to COVID since COVID has been you know, we've kind of been covering for quite a few years. Um, as you know, uh, May 11th, um, the United States is going to drop COVID as a, I don't, I don't know if they're declaring the pandemic is over, but they're going to drop all the restrictions. So I, I imagine that means that there are no requirements anymore for masks, vaccine requirements. Um, I think anyone from any, anyone from other countries can come in. Novak Djokovic can play this year in the U.S. Open. So, um, and I was just wondering, you know, what do you feel about that? Because it's not really based on science. Well, I think that governments usually make policies that have to balance. Mm -hmm. public questions as well as science. Um, and, you know, the, I think that each individual needs to make a decision about how, what they want to do. I personally still wear a mask when I go in indoors to, you know, large, large places. I don't have a problem doing that. Um, and I think that people should continue to to do what makes them feel comfortable and what makes them feel safe. Yeah, I, I, mean, I still wear masks. Um, yeah. But um, it's, I learned they're not foolproof. I did, I did get COVID in November. Yeah, well, masks work better when everyone's wearing them. Yeah, yes. that's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, it's, you know, there's ways to mitigate, um, you know, risks, not just about COVID, but like there's lots of, nasty viruses that that aren't fun to get also. So wearing a mask when you know that there's a high risk in your local community or if you're vulnerable or at higher risk, I think makes a lot of sense. I have friends who are sicker from the flu than I, I was with COVID. <laughs> no, no, no. So um, nobody knows how you're going to react, that's for sure. So uh, as I you know said earlier that um, a lot of scientists were really, you know, very shaken up by the attacks they got. And um, do you think science will ever be the same? I don't think science was the same before. Like, I, I, I mean, I, I I think that there's been generally an erosion of trust in most institutions. I mean, people mm -hmm. don't trust newspapers anymore. People don't trust the government. People don't trust politicians. People don't trust scientists. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And like, I think the message to me of my book, and I think it applies to what these parents are trying to do, but it also applies to COVID moving forward. I really believe that when we have conversations, when we're able to really talk about 
what is what issue bothers you? What are you scared of? What is, what is making you react in a certain way? What kind of evidence do you need that would make you feel more comfortable to do one thing or another? I mean, again, to go back to that model of science conversations rather than science communication, um, I think that that will help all of us moving forward. Okay, so um, before I, I thank you for being here, and, th and thank you for being here, I want to mention uh, next Wednesday, I'm going to uh, interview a, a scientist who um, is in charge of uh, detecting pathogens through wastewater. Oh, that's great. Which is good, and uh, which the yeah. CDC says they're now going to start looking at airplanes. Yeah, uh, I'm fascinated by the air. I mean, I have to fly for work also, so I'm I'm very intrigued to find out what's going on on the airplanes. Yeah, well, I was I was asked to do a a, um, a project um, by a government agency on wastewater, and I interviewed the head of the uh, wastewater um, detection in New York City, and he said that you know their offices were always open; they never closed during the pandemic. And he said that, you know, through wastewater, they were able to determine that the COVID um, in the East Coast came from Europe, but the COVID in the West Coast came, came from China. Wow. And it's also a great thing for testing people who are not always, you know, so willing to, you know, be tested, such as prisoners. Uh, you can test a whole, you know, if a, if a uh, college is near, you know, water, you can test the whole water of the college. Yeah, so I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that. We'll send announcements out about that. And so that I, sounds like it'll wanna, be a good conversation. Yeah. So anyway, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, your book is really compelling. Um, I would say buy it today or pre-order it today, and then uh, go look at your local bookstore for it. It's it's, it's very well written. It's very compelling. And um, although the the you know the, the disease is heartbreaking, the the story of the parents that you follow is very inspiring. Hmm. Oh, I, I, really... I was inspired by them. <laughs> okay, that's great. Again, thank you for being with us and thank you for thank your you. great writing in the Wall Street Journal, which I followed a long time. Thank okay. you for having me. <laughs> Good night, everyone, and stay safe. Bye. Bye.